Another day of biochemistry. Reminder that we have an exam a week from today. Oh boy. Yes, I will have a review session for the exam. Um, I haven't set a date or time for it. I will announce that likely at the next um, lecture. And we should be set for that. Uh, I will videotape that, that, that um, review session if you can't make it to the time I set. And I have a question. Um, is the exam going to be at this time? Or the exam will be at this time, in this room, exactly like class, except for instead of me talking, it'll be you writing. OK, other questions? Ready to dive into enzymes? So last time we talked, or I talked about, we didn't talk, but I talked about the um, basics of enzymes, how it is that catalysis occurs, and so forth. And we're going to see more about that today. Today, our approach to enzymes is going to be mostly kinetic in nature. Kinetic meaning uh, moving. And so enzymes, of course, move reactions. And so we're going to see how things move. We talk about velocities with enzymatic reactions. We're going to see what velocity is and understand a bit about that. Last time at the end of the lecture, I um, showed this uh, diagram here. This diagram showed us the overall scheme that we talk about for an enzymatic reaction. An enzyme binds to a substrate, creates an enzyme substrate complex. That enzyme substrate complex changes in some way so that the reaction occurs that creates the enzyme substrate star complex which is in the middle of the reaction. When the reaction is complete, we have products formed and still held by the enzyme, known as the EP complex. And finally, the enzyme, if we want to think about it, relaxes and lets go of the products. And the products are released to create the E plus P. OK, there it is in bigger view. So what we're really interested in when we're studying kinetics of enzymes, at least in this class, is we're interested in understanding the rate of formation of product. The rate of formation of product. And that's a good simplification for us because we don't have to worry uh, much about the steps involved in getting to that. We're really interested in how it is that ES goes to product. Well, because of that, we're going to focus on really four things. And you can see those four things in the uh, plot that's on the screen here. The four things being the concentration of substrate, the concentration of the product, the concentration of the free enzyme, that is enzyme not bound to substrate, and the concentration of the enzyme substrate complex. Those four things give us the um, sort of structure that we need to think about in studying an enzyme's velocity. And I'll talk about velocity, as I said, in just a bit. If you notice this plot, it shows concentration of each of those items as a function of time. Okay, As a function of time. When we start out the reaction at time 0, as we have on the, le the, the far left side of this plot, we can see that the substrate concentration is highest. And that's not surprising, because remember that an enzyme is catalyzing a reaction, and in the reaction, the substrate is getting used. So we see the enzyme substrate concentration getting, starting high and moving lower because substrate is being converted into product. The enzyme concentration is relatively high to start. That is the free enzyme because we haven't even started the reaction. We haven't mixed the substrate with the enzyme. So essentially, to begin with, there is no enzyme substrate complex, meaning that all of the enzyme is present as free enzyme. Not surprisingly, since everything is present as free enzyme, the concentration of enzyme substrate complex is zero to start. And the concentration of product is zero, because the reaction has not yet started. Usually, these reactions will begin by the addition of an enzyme to a mixture. Now, how do we do these kinds of studies? I didn't talk last time, but I want you to have an understanding about how it is that we perform these kinds of an analysis. Right? 
time, as we will see, will be a consideration here. But before I talk about time, I want to talk about an experiment, how I would set the experiment up to do this, and then we'll talk about time. Well, I'm interested in understanding the relationship between the concentration of substrate and the production of product. Okay? I want to understand that relationship. So to study that, I would take, let's say, 20 tubes. And into each tube, I would put buffer, because my enzyme is going to need buffer in order to be stable. I would put varying amounts of substrate. One end, I would have no substrate. The other end, I would have a lot of substrate. And the middle tubes, I would have varying amounts. So I might have 20 tubes, going from zero up to 1,000 millimolar, for example, 1,000 micromolar. That'd be a one millimolar, OK? Doesn't matter what that, what that concentration is. But we have a high end, and we have a zero. Make sense? So my zero should have no product being formed, because there's no substrate. I might sort of intuitively expect that at the high end, when I add the enzyme, I'm going to get more product than I would the others, because the higher concentration of substrate. right? But I don't know that until I do the experiment. Well, the last thing I add to each tube is I add the same amount of enzyme. So the only variable I have in those tubes is the concentration of substrate. Each tube differs in concentration of substrate. And my question is, what happens to the concentration of product produced per time? So I'm going to let each reaction go for exactly the same amount of time, maybe one minute, let's say. And then at the end of that, I stop the reaction, and I measure the concentration of product. Everybody with me? 20 tubes, same everything except varying amounts of substrate, including the same amount of time. At the end of that, I stop the reaction and measure the concentration of product. The velocity that happens in that reaction will be measured as the concentration of product divided by the time. Just like, mile, just like uh, speed is the distance traveled divided by the amount of time, the velocity of a reaction is equal to the concentration of product divided by the amount of time. Everybody with me? OK. So that's the background now we need to understand in doing an overall reaction. Now, I've already shown you that at the beginning of the reaction that things are rapidly changing. At the very beginning of the reaction, we haven't set up a time yet. We're trying to figure the ideal time to run this reaction. I said we'll pick one minute, right? But we're going to see on this graph what, where the ideal place to, the ideal time to measure the concentration of product. That's what we're trying to determine. What is the ideal time? Well, if I measure the concentration of product instantaneously, let's say within milliseconds of starting the reaction, that would be really fast, then I would expect I would see widely varying concentration of free enzyme and bound enzyme, because that's when the complex is starting to form. I see that in that very short interval that's shown on green on the image, that the concentration of free enzyme is rapidly dropping, and the concentration of enzyme substrate complex is rapidly increasing. That's a big variable, because my rate of production of product is going to be a function of the concentration of ES. Well, if ES is rapidly changing, that's going to be pretty hard to reproduce in terms of my measurements. Right? So I don't want to be measuring my product at a time when the concentration of ES is rapidly changing, and consequently, the concentration of free enzyme, E, is rapidly changing. So for the kinds of measurements I'm going to do, very, very quick measurements are not going to be ideal. If I go out a little ways, I see that, relatively speaking, the concentration of ES and E are relatively constant within the brown region. They're not changing nearly as much over time as they were in that green part of the graph. So if I measure a concentration in this range, I can expect I will get more reliable 
measurements of velocity than if I measure it in that green region. Everybody with me? Question on that? What I've just described to you is what we call within, the, and by the way, we're studying what are called Michaelis Menten kinetics. Yes, question. Question. Yes. So you're saying, why is the concentration of product not going up as high as the concentration of substrate was? Uh, if there's a one-to-one -one relationship between them, but there might not be. Yeah. But it, this, is, this is a depiction. It's not a, a intended to be quantitative. Okay. So I mean, for example, I could have made the, the concentration of enzyme as high as the, that of the substrate if I chose. So it's, it's, it's an arbitrary scale. But, but this is illustrating the changes overall. Okay. So that's, that's really what we're after here. Okay. So what we're studying are under conditions that are known as michaelis menten kinetics. And you'll see the name in the highlights. I won't spell it out for you here. Okay. And michaelis menten kinetics specify what's called steady state concentrations. Steady state is what's happening in that brown region of the graph. They're called steady because the concentration of enzyme substrate complex and the concentration of free enzyme are not changing much over time, relatively speaking. So we want to let the reaction go long enough in order to be in that steady state range. What happens if I let the reaction go too long? Well, look what happens to the concentration of substrate. Look what happens to the concentration of product. Look what happens to the concentration of ES and E. They all start changing fairly rapidly again. Another problem. The more product accumulates, the more the reaction will start going backwards. Because we remember that enzymatic reactions are reversible. The more product there is, the more likely we will start measuring the backwards reaction, which is not going to help me understand the velocity of the forward reaction, which is what I'm interested in. It would be like jumping in a car and saying, I'm going to Philomath. I'm going to see how fast I get there. And along the way, I stop and I back up for a certain period of time before I go forward. That's going to throw off my measurement of my forward progress, right? So we don't want to have that backwards part. So we want to measure the concentration of product late enough that we're not in the pre-steady state, but early enough that we're not in the accumulation of product state. That's why we have a sort of a brown region there. For our purposes, we'll say that's about a minute for a, for a reaction that we're interested in. Okay. We measure that reaction in about a minute. OK. Well, when we've done that, we can be reasonably assured that we're not having much backward reaction and that our measurements are going to be fairly accurate because we don't have widely varying concentrations of enzyme substrate complex. Everybody with me there? That's kind of convoluted, but there's a, there's a lot of things that's there. Question. Where I get silence in here, guys. Yes? Yeah. That's right. So his question is, when I say backwards, basically, what is backwards involved? And is it happen because the product is accumulating in the test tube? And the answer is exactly that. The more product I have, the more I'm going to favor the backwards reaction. So I don't want to measure this when product gets too high. Because ultimately, if I let this reaction go to completion, where am I going to be at? There's a word to describe it. Equilibrium. And when I'm at equilibrium, what happens to the concentration of product and reactant? It does not change, right? Well, that's not going to tell me anything. So I clearly don't want to wait too long to measure this product. Okay? I'm interested in velocity. I'm not interested in this case in equilibrium concentrations. Other things, I may be very well interested in equilibrium concentrations. But for this measurement, I'm interested in velocity. I want to know how fast this sucker can go forwards. I don't want to see any backwards. I don't want to see anything else. I want to see it going forwards. 
OK. Well, does that mean that that green part of the graph is of no use? The answer is no. All right. For our purposes, we're not going to consider that green part of the graph. But I want to let you know that there are people who are very interested in that green part of the graph. They study what's called pre-steady state kinetics. And pre-steady state kinetics <coughs> excuse me, requires measuring things very, very rapidly. As I say, on the order of milliseconds, thousandths of a second. Because that helps them to understand things like the rate of formation of the ES complex, mechanism of reaction. We're not going to concern ourselves with those. All right? But those are important measurements of enzyme reactions for many people. Okay? So I want you to just be familiar with what that term is. Pre-steady state kinetics. So in pre-steady state kinetics, we see rapid changes in ES concentration. We see rapid changes in free enzyme concentration. Those things are fairly constant in steady state kinetics. OK? OK. Well, let's get our head around what's happening in that tube. We've got 20 different tubes. We've got 20 different concentrations of substrate. And each tube has the same amount of enzyme. Let's think about the tubes that have very little substrate in them. I've drawn this figure so that I have three different tubes. One that has a low concentration of substrate, one that has a medium concentration of substrate, and one that has a high concentration of substrate. What's happening in the tube with the lowest concentration of substrate is that a lot of the enzyme is sitting there looking, as you can see on the screen, empty. It's not bound to substrate. Why does that happen? Well, the binding of substrate by an enzyme is a random process. It's diffusion driven. Things are bouncing around inside of that solution in the buffer. And when they hit, oh, binding. If I have a low concentration of substrate, all right, it makes it less likely that one of those is going to bounce into an enzyme. So when I have a low substrate concentration, the enzyme Many of the enzymes are sitting there empty, waiting for a substrate to bounce into it, or vice versa. That means that a lot of the time, the enzyme is not going to be active. The enzyme is not going to do anything. The analogy I like to give for these is that of a factory. I like to think about making automobiles. If I have a factory okay, that has a whole um, setup to make automobiles, and I don't have enough parts to assemble a complete automobile, and I'm waiting for parts to come in, my rate of formation of automobiles is going to be a function of how many parts I can get in and through the assembly line. The factory is the enzyme. The parts are the substrate. If I don't get enough parts into the factory, the workers are going to be standing around a fair amount of the time going, are those parts here yet? Are those parts here yet? Waiting for the parts to get there to make that automobile. At medium substrate concentrations, I have more parts. I've got more parts. And if I have more parts and I have the same number of workers, and by the way, the enzyme and the workers are the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the factory and the workers are actually the enzyme, have the same number of workers, have the same factory, but now I've got more parts, and assuming everybody is willing to work, right? then I'm going to put out more automobiles per time than if I have limiting numbers of parts. I'm still going to be limited, though, right? I'm going to be limited by having enough parts. I might not have enough parts to work at capacity, but I would have more parts than I had to work with in the first scenario where I had very, very few parts. All right. We shift now to the factory at high amounts of parts. The bosses are sitting around going, these workers in the factory are sitting around most of the time. They're not doing anything. And the reason they're not doing anything isn't because they're goofing off. They just don't have enough materials to make automobiles. What we, as the bosses, have to do is ensure that there's plenty of parts to make these automobiles. So that as soon as one worker finishes, with one automobile, they've got another part ready 
to start building another one. Okay? In the last scenario, there's no limitation of parts. The workers are constantly supplied with parts. They finish one, they start another. They finish one, they start another. They finish one, they start another. In the other scenarios, they finished one, they waited a while for the next part. And the amount of time they waited was a function of how many parts that were there available. So now this last scenario, they've got plenty of parts. They've got the stockyard full of parts for every possible part they would need. Okay? They have saturated the factory and the workers with parts. The factory is going to be producing automobiles at its maximum rate, the fastest they can roll off that assembly line. No limitations in terms of the enzyme, in this case the factory and the workers, having to wait for something to come. The last scenario, I have reached the maximum velocity that the factory is going to make cars, and I have reached the maximum velocity that an enzyme will catalyze a reaction. So that's our first parameter we need to understand. It's something called Vmax. Vmax occurs when an enzyme is saturated with substrate. It occurs when an enzyme is saturated with substrate. It's not waiting for substrate, because as soon as it lets go of one product, another substrate pops into the uh, substrate binding site and the reaction starts again. No waiting for anything. Vmax. Now, Vmax has another real-world analogy, and it's oftentimes not taught when people talk about enzyme kinetics. I want to make sure you guys get this. Students in my majors class oftentimes don't get this. So I want to make sure that you get this. You're not majors, so let's be good. You'll raise your hand, right? This is, we, we did it. Vmax is dependent upon the amount of enzyme. What's the real-world analogy? Well. If I have one factory, and that one factory can only put out 100 cars a day, adding more parts isn't going to make any difference, because parts are no longer limiting. What's limiting is the capacity of the factory to put stuff out, right? In the case of the reaction, what's limiting is the amount of enzymes to put out the substrate. What if I, as the boss, have a brilliant idea, we make another factory next to the first one, we make the second factory and we hire a bunch more workers and we supply them with parts like we supplied the first one, do you suppose we would double our capacity? Absolutely. Absolutely. We double our capacity. If I add twice the amount of enzyme, do you suppose I will double the velocity of, pro of, of product production? Yes. Vmax is a function of enzyme concentration. Remember that. It means that I can't compare Vmaxes, because Vmax has inherently built into it a certain amount of enzyme. I haven't said anything about how much enzyme is there. Someone, people compare Vmaxes, and it's like, well, that's nice, but this enzyme over here used one, and this one over here used 1,000. Can I really compare those? Can't do that. Everybody follow that? Now, we're going to come to a parameter in just a little bit that's going to take that concentration into consideration and give us another quantity. So Vmax is useful, and Vmax is an important quantity, but Vmax is dependent upon the amount of enzyme. It does not give quantitative information, Okay, at least not comparable quantitative information. All right, well, this graph shows graphically what I just described to you. Imagine I have those 20 tubes. I give each one a fixed amount of time for the reaction to occur, and then I measure the concentration of product and divide it by the time. If I measure the concentration of product divided by the time, I get a velocity. And that velocity on this graph is plotted on the y-axis. It's called V0. It's called V0 not because it's at time 0, but rather because it's what's called the initial velocity. Initial velocity refers to the fact that we're measuring in that steady state condition. We're measuring the initial velocity in that steady state condition, V0. The x-axis shows the substrate concentration. 
So each tube gets a V0 and a substrate concentration, and I plot each of those points on a plot like this. And I, when I draw those points and sort of smooth it out, what I see is what you see on the screen. It's called a V versus S plot. Initial velocity measured as product versus time. Substrate concentration in molarity. Okay. I add more substrate, I get more velocity. At low substrate concentration, the enzyme's sitting around. It's not very productive. And we can see that the velocity is very low because the enzyme, a lot of the enzyme is twiddling its thumbs, waiting for substrate, like the factory without the parts. At high concentrations of substrate, that is high concentrations of parts at the factory, more cars roll out, in this case more product rolls out, and the enzymes are saturated. They're almost always busy. Look what this graph tells us. It tells us that at saturating con concentrations of substrate, the velocity levels off. It doesn't just go up, 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 up forever. It has a capacity. And that's what I've already told you in words. Like the factory can't go beyond a certain point in terms of how many cars it produces, no matter how many parts are there, so too can an enzyme not go any faster if you increase the amount of substrate. That is what gives us Vmax. We see that drawn here very nicely. Vmax is that dotted line at the top. We'll see that it approaches Vmax. We keep adding more and more and more, and we have less and less of an effect after a point. This graph also shows, us, well, shows a couple things. We can see the individual points now instead of it just being smoothed. But we also see another parameter. Another parameter is labeled on here as Km. We're going to be concerned about Km because Km tells us some important information. I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. We're interested in velocity, but we're also interested in how well the enzyme likes its substrate. How much affinity does it have? We were interested in affinity for hemoglobin for oxygen. We saw that affinity change as the oxygen concentration went up. Hemoglobin got more affinity for its substrate, right? Affinity is a, is a desire to grab a hold of. It's like your significant other. Bad joke. OK? This affinity is something that we're interested in. Well, how will we measure an enzyme's affinity for its substrate? You say, well, and what a lot of people will initially say is, well, it's the amount of substrate it takes to get to Vmax. There's something wrong with that, right? Why is there something wrong with that? You never get to it. You see, this is, this is a tangent. Okay, It's a limit. So we all know it's going to be high substrate concentration to get to Vmax, so that doesn't tell us anything about an enzyme, right? What tells us about an enzyme's affinity is not its substrate concentration to get to Vmax, but rather its substrate concentration to get to Vmax over 2. Notice on that graph, at Vmax over 2, we haven't saturated the enzyme. The enzyme has a certain velocity. Let's imagine I have another enzyme that's very much like this one. And I do the same kind of kinetic plot. And I see that graph that I see above shifted to the right. Based on what we said about hemoglobin's binding of oxygen, what did shifting to the right of the, that plot mean? Anybody remember? Nobody? Less affinity. Thank you, brave person. Less affinity. Shifting to the right means, in this case, it takes higher substrate concentration to get to the same Vmax over 2. It takes more substrate to bang into the enzyme before the enzyme wakes up and starts catalyzing a reaction. KM has an inverse relationship with enzyme affinity. High KMs mean low affinity because it takes more substrate to wake the enzyme up. Low KMs mean high affinity. The enzyme is literally grabbing the substrate every time it sees it. It likes the substrate. 
All right? There's the same thing. And by the way, actually, we'll see it on here. There's a very important consideration. Km is a measure of the affinity. Km is the substrate concentration that gives Vmax over 2. It is not Vmax over 2. Vmax over 2, you will see here, is on the y-axis. Km is on the x-axis. Km is a concentration. Again, it's the concentration that gives Vmax over 2. Don't forget that. Okay? Km is the concentration that gives Vmax over 2. There's Vmax. We can see the difference between Vmax over 2 and Km. Okay. Well, we can go through a lot of derivations. Do you have a question? So does the, okay, so his question, question is, if the curve moves to the right, that means less affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. Does that mean less activation energy? And there's not a relationship there. There's also, I'll emphasize, and thank you for asking that question, there's, I'll also emphasize to you, there's no relationship between Km and Vmax. High Km doesn't mean high Vmax. It doesn't mean low Vmax. We'll see some enzymes have high Kms and low Vmaxes. Some have high Vmaxes, low Kms. Some have middle of the both, right? There's no relationship between Km and Vmax. They're independent of each other. Km is a constant for an enzyme. Vmax was not a constant because it depended on the amount of enzyme. Km is a constant for an enzyme. It doesn't matter how much enzyme I measure, affinity is independent of enzyme concentration. Vmax is not independent of enzyme concentration. It's dependent upon it. Okay. Not Vmax over 2. There we go. All right. Anyway, so I got to this. This, uh, if I can do a bunch of derivations, I get to what's called the michaelis menten equation. I'm showing it to you. You're not going to memorize it. All right? We're not going to do calculations based on it, but I want to expose you to it so that you see what it, what it says. It says that V0, the, vo the initial velocity at any point, so I could take the different substrate concentrations that I measure, I could plug them into this equation if I knew the Vmax and the Km, and I could predict for any substrate concentration what that initial velocity would be. This equation lets me do that. Okay? The michaelis menten equation lets me predict the initial velocity based on these other parameters. I'm not interested in the equation. I'm interested in your understanding of the parameters that I've been describing to you. Km, Vmax, the real world analogies, how do these play in together? Okay? Now, there's the plot, the V versus S that you've been seeing. You might think that all enzymes show V versus S. Question? Yeah? We will talk about the effect of inhibition, okay, on Friday. And it's the apparent KM that actually changes. It's not the actual KM. And we'll, see, we'll, we'll talk about that on Friday, about why that's the case. But good question, yeah. So KM is a constant for an enzyme. The apparent KM will change, but not the KM. OK? OK. Well, here's a plot of another enzyme. The enzyme on the left beha behaves in what we call michaelis menten kinetics. The enzyme on the right does not. What does the enzyme on the right look like? Where have you seen that kind of a, of a plot before? Hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin's affinity for binding oxygen, right? And what happened when hemoglobin bound to oxygen? What was this curve illustrating the principle of? Good thing I'm not giving you guys the exam today. In what? Greater affinity. It's not greater affinity. It's changing affinity. What was that changing affinity illustrating the principle of? Cooperativity, exa exactly. All right? In the curve on the right, when we had hemoglobin, we said it, at low concentrations of oxygen, hemoglobin had low affinity for oxygen. 
And at higher concentrations of oxygen, hemoglobin had high affinity for oxygen, right? Hemoglobin is binding to oxygen exactly the way that an enzyme is binding to a substrate. If I have a multiple subunit enzyme, which many enzymes are, and the binding of one substrate affects the enzyme's binding of another substrate, wouldn't we expect it should look exactly like we see the binding of hemoglobin for oxygen? Yes. So when we see that sigmoidal plot, it tells us that the enzyme is changing as a result of its binding of a substrate. Okay. You see the term allosteric. I'm going to define allosteric for you later, but allosterism relates to effects on proteins by binding molecules. Okay. On the left, the substrate does not change the enzyme's binding. On the right, it does. So we see, if we increase the affinity for the substrate, this plot on the left isn't going to apply because the enzyme's changing. And the one on the left, the enzyme is not changing. The binding of the substrate is not having any effect on the binding of additional substrate. That's michaelis menten kinetics. non michaelis menten kinetics on the right. Okay, there's our equation. Several points. Vmax occurs when an enzyme is saturated by substrate. Vmax varies with the amount of enzyme that we use. Km is a measure of the enzyme's affinity for its substrate. Km's value is inversely related to affinity. High Km, low affinity. Low Km, high affinity. OK. Vmax, they said, is proportional to the amount of an enzyme used. I can't compare Vmaxes of two enzymes because that doesn't have any information about how much enzyme I used. What if I include or think about the amount of enzyme that I used? What if I took the Vmax for an enzyme and divided it by the concentration of the enzyme that I used? What would I get? Well, what I would get would be concentration of product divided by concentration of enzyme divided by time. Concentration will cancel concentration. What I end up with is something called per time. I would get a number divided by time. I could have a thousand per second. Commonly we do these in seconds. We could do it in minutes, it doesn't matter. A thousand per second would mean that every molecule of enzyme is making 1,000 molecules of product per second. Now this parameter that I've just defined is independent of enzyme concentration because I've already taken it into consideration. Okay, Number of molecules made by each enzyme molecule per time. This is known as the turnover number, and that's that K cat that I told you about in the last lecture. K cat is equal to the number of molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per time. It does not vary with the amount of enzyme. I can compare K cats of two different enzymes and have an idea about their relative speeds. I can't do that with Vmax. Okay? This plot now shows you some K cats. Ah, I'm sorry, K cats divided by KMs. I need to define that. I showed you K cats the other day. I showed you that carbonic anhydrase had a K cat of about a million per second meaning it made one million, each molecule of enzyme made one million molecules of product every second. Amazing. What in the heck is K cat over KM? Why do I care about that? Well, this, I need to make you think about something. Before I do that, let me just take questions. Do you have questions about what I've been saying? I'm going through some fairly dense stuff. Question. Because concentration counts, they're both molarities, right? So I end up with a relative number. It's a good question. But constant molarity divided by molarity is going to give no unit. And I end up with a number. So I might have one millimolar on top and one micromolar on the bottom. That's 1,000 to 1. I would have 1,000 per time. Okay? 
Okay. Other questions? It's hard to get your head around. I want you to think hard about these. Okay? Think hard about these. My strong belief, as I said at the beginning of class, is for you to have a practical knowledge of biochemistry. I trust you can punch a number into a calculator. I want you to understand what these concepts mean. Punching numbers into calculators, you're not going to do, as I said. But understanding what the heck Vmax is is important. Understanding what Km is, what Kcat is. How does one do a reaction? How does one do a, an experiment? Okay? These are important things for you to understand. The punching into a calculator part is for a math class. Concepts matter here. Okay? All right. Well, let's come back to then what I said here. I've introduced a new parameter, kcat divided by km. Why am I doing this? Ahern's throwing numbers and equations at us, right? The reason that I've done this is I'm interested in characterizing enzymes in another way. Let's think about an ideal enzyme for a moment. An ideal enzyme would have a couple of properties. One, I think you would all agree, it would have a very high velocity, right? Very high kcat. Right? All right? So we would agree that it would, it would work really rapidly. It would make product very quickly. Right? Nobody's saying anything. I guess it'd be OK. All right? The ideal enzyme wouldn't take very much substrate to get to Vmax over 2. It's grabbing substrate. It's doing its thing. So the ideal enzyme will have a very high kcat it will have a very low Km. A measure of how ideal an enzyme is would then be the, the ratio of Kcat divided by Km. So I'm measuring ideality of an enzyme with Kcat over Km. These enzymes are enzymes that we call perfect enzymes. Now I'll explain why that's perfect in a second. But a perfect enzyme is an enzyme that has a ratio of kcat to km that is basically maximized. Now, these vary a little bit in terms of kcat to km, but they're all essentially in the same range, about 10 to the eighth. Okay? About 10 to the eighth. We call these enzymes perfect enzymes because we can't get that ratio any higher. If we mutate the enzyme, we will always get a lower ratio. Can't make it any faster, can't make it grab things any better. Anything, any changes we make to that enzyme makes it a less uh, effective enzyme. And so this, therefore, is a perfect enzyme. Maximum speed, kcat, minimum amount of substrate required to get there. Okay. Perfect enzymes really do exist. Perfect enzymes, the reason that that number doesn't go any higher is because the limitation in the action of these enzymes, the only limitation that they have is the rate with which the substrate can diffuse into the substrate binding site of the enzyme. Perfect enzymes. Why aren't all enzymes perfect? Well. I think I've mentioned in this class before, but I'll mention again. If I'm going to Fred Meyer and I want to pick up a loaf of bread, I can jump into my Indy 500 race car and get there really quickly. And there's no question I would get there quickly than if I went, rode there on my bicycle. Right? If speed were the only consideration, that would be the thing to do. But I have other considerations like, shall we say, safety? If everybody that is, all the enzymes, we're going to Fred Meyer to get a, lo get a loaf of bread in their Indy race car, can we imagine that the accident rate might go up a bit? Enzymes are so powerful speed demons that running too fast for all enzymes makes that the cell be out of control. We'll see later when we talk about metabolism that burning something up too quickly means energy gets wasted. Cells tightly control how rapidly they do stuff. So if every enzyme is perfect, you got problems. That's why every enzyme is not perfect. Why are any enzymes perfect? We'll see some reasons for that as well. Okay? 
All right, here's one of those reasons. Here's an enzyme called triose phosphate isomerase. Triose phosphate isomerase catalyzes the reaction that you can see here. It catalyzes the top reaction, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate being converted into the bottom molecule, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. It's a reaction of glycolysis. And you'll notice in the middle, the middle, in the middle there's enediol intermediate. That enediol intermediate is unstable. If it's allowed to accumulate, or if it sits around for any period of time, it will fall apart and make methylglyoxal, which is a very poisonous compound. To prevent enediol intermediate from being present for any period of time, this enzyme has evolved to be perfect, so it makes that reaction go to the bottom as quickly as it possibly can. There's essentially no chance to make methylglyoxal because this enzyme is perfect. The cell's perfection here, or the enzyme's perfection, is essential for the cell's viability. Okay. There's other reasons. Enzymes I mentioned before use cofactors <clears throat> to help them catalyze reactions. Cofactors can be <clears throat> other molecules. You see a variety listed here. Other metals. I don't throw this up here to give you something to memorize. Just to show you some of the things that enzymes use to catalyze reactions. One last concept I'm going to introduce very briefly, and I'll talk more about it next time, is something called a line weaver burke plot. If you hadn't had enough math today, well, you're going to get some more. And as I say, I'm going to explain this in more detail next time, but I want to introduce the topic here. Line weaver burke is another way of plotting V versus S data. It's exactly the same data. You do the 20 test tubes, you measure the 20 velocities, you get the 20 substrate concentrations. Instead of plotting the velocity versus the substrate concentration in a line weaver burke plot, you plot one over the velocity versus one over the substrate concentration. They're known as double reciprocal plots. <clears> That's <throat> why you see on the y-axis one over V0, and on the x-axis one over substrate concentration. It's exactly the same data. But by plotting it in this way, we see that that hyperbolic plot that we had for V versus S becomes linear. And the beauty of this linear plot is that the y-intercept is very easy to determine, meaning that I know exactly what Vmax is by knowing exactly what 1 over Vmax is. The y-intercept in a line weaver burke plot is 1 over Vmax. If I want to know what Vmax is, I don't have to guess where that tangent line was. I do a line weaver burke and the y-intercept tells me the value of 1 over Vmax. I take the reciprocal of that, I've got Vmax. The x-intercept on a line weaver burke plot gives me minus 1 over Km. I precisely know the value of Km as a result of that. Okay. Blah, blah. I'm going to talk about that next time. I think it's time that you guys have been patient. We're going to have a song. This song is the most popular song I've ever written. Okay? It's been downloaded more times than any other song I've written. I hope that you will join me in singing this song. Reactions alone can starve your cells to the bone. Thank God we all produce enzymes. Hands up! And it's range to make the chemicals change because you always use enzymes. Sometimes mechanisms lack like they are at the races. Witness the carcat of the carbonic anhydrases. How do they work inside of the active site. It just grabs onto a substrate and squeezes it tight in an enzyme. Catalysis in an enzyme. V versus S in an enzyme. All of this working for you. Energy peaks are what an enzyme defeats in its catalysis. Enzymes, transition state is what an enzyme does great, and you should all know this. Enzymes, 
catalytic action won't unravel them, get hysteric. Cells can follow pathways with an enzyme allosteric. You know it's true. So when an effector fits, it will just rearrange all the subunits inside an enzyme. Flipping from R to T, enzyme. Slow catalytically, enzyme. No change in delta G. You should relax when seeking out the VMAX, though there are many steps. Enzymes, Lyme, Weaver, Burke, can save a scientist's work with just two intercepts. Enzymes, plotting all the data from kinetic exploration, lets you match a line into a best-fitting equation. Here's what you do. Both axes are inverted, then you can determine Vmax and establish Km for your enzymes. Sterically holding tight enzymes, substrates positioned right enzymes inside the active site. Enzymes.